Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Joe and I'm from York Health Economics Consortium and today my talk is going to be a bit of a change in pace from what we've had really. It's going to be a bit of a intro beginner's guide to Shiny modules in the hope that for those of you who are developing Shiny apps that you can start using these modules to try and streamline your code that you are using. So just before we get started, I just want to say that all the code that I'll go through today is available via this GitHub link. So those of you online, you can try and type it in as fast as possible whilst it's there on the screen. Um, but the, the, the code that's there, it will create a toy model effectively that is just a simple decision tree, but hopefully allows you to see how shiny modules can be implemented in a larger app. So it's nothing too fancy, but I'll bring it up on screen at the end of this as well. So before we start talking about Shiny modules, it's probably worth talking about R and R Shiny more generally. Um, I appreciate that I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit in this room, but as um, analyzing more, more complex data sets becomes more computationally possible with programs such as R, we are starting to see an increase of R in use for HDA submissions. Furthermore, as we start looking at interventions that are targeting niche patients, we're starting to look at more and more complex patient pathways as well. So we start having a need for things such as patient level simulation models and so on and so on. Now, again, for everyone in this room, that's probably fine. If someone showed you a model in R, a cost effectiveness model, and you wanted to run it through, run different scenarios, you're probably all very comfortable with the code and you could have a go at that. However, there are certain people who are going to be more focused on the inputs and the outputs. That's all they tend to care about. And they are going to want a more user friendly experience to it. They're going to want more of a point and click type approach. So that's why some people have started turning to our shiny. We've already seen a little bit of our shiny today, and I think there's a couple more talks on our shiny later. Um, but people are turning to it, and that's because you can host your app on a server, and it can be accessed via any web-based. Uh, oh, it, you can host it on a server, and then you can create a web-based user interface for people to interact with your model that way. So for some people, it has an advantage because it means they don't need to manage or interact with code. They don't need to install packages or deal with package conflicts. That's a big one when I'm usually trying to send R models to people who aren't usually that familiar with R. They get all sorts of warnings when it comes to package installation and freak out a little bit. So you can avoid all of that by just sending them a web link and they can interact with your model and they don't need to worry about any code whatsoever. But because Shiny is on the rise and because it's being used for more and more complex models, it tends to mean we end up building more complex user interfaces to try and deal with that. So to give the users as much flexibility as possible, we end up storing hundreds of inputs in that aren't quite necessarily needed. So because we're repeating UI elements in Shiny, we end up repeating a lot of code because you want a numeric input for this, you want a numeric input for that. But if you've got multiple interventions and comparators, you're actually trying to run the same set of inter uh, inputs for both of those. You just want it repeated for as many comparators that you've got within your economic model. So this is several issues when you're repeating the code. The first one is it makes it a lot harder to edit. So if you've made a mistake in one of your functions or something like that, and you've got it repeated over and over again um, in different places within your app, you've got to remember to update it in all of them. And that's fine if you've only got to do it a couple of handfuls of times, but there will always be that one that slips through the net and you will forget about it and your model will contain some kind of error. It also means that it makes, makes it a lot harder to QA. That feedback to the same one is there, that the more code there is to review, the more likely there are to be errors that creep in and slip through the net. And finally, the other big one, and I'm sure those of you who have used Shiny before will know that you have to come up with unique ID names for your inputs that you're using. They, they, they can't be repeated, they've got to be unique per input. And if you're unlike, well, if you're like me, you end up using some very long and some very unhelpful names to try and distinguish between all your uh, inputs. Like, Input shiny one, two, three, four, five, like the list goes on. You don't come up with very imaginative names either. Again, that makes it a lot harder to QA to follow around what's going where and what's doing what. So 
the solution to this really is um, shiny modules. I've only come across these uh, in the last year. I don't know if anyone else has come across shiny modules before, but they have completely changed the way that I develop shiny modules, uh, shiny apps. So shiny modules are designed to be reusable and they actually provide um, the user, uh, well, they're designed to be reusable so you can repeat them over and over again because they're essentially our functions that are creating either shiny UI or server elements within your app. They go slightly beyond functions though, because they invoke a thing called the namespace, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in a uh, few slides time, but effectively the namespace is how you're able to store your input ID names. And the way that shiny modules work is they help avoid that naming conflict that goes on. So if I just show you a very simple example of a UI module here, this UI module is designed to take a unique text file, process it, and then display it in an output box for the user to see in the app. So there's not too much uh, going on here, nothing too fancy. But we need this several times because there's several text files that we want to display on our app for whatever reason. So just like a function, um, Within R, you can provide uh, the Shiny modules a whole series of user-defined inputs. But the key thing to note here is the ID function must always be the first in that list of arguments, because it's that ID function that will allow you to link UIs and server modules together later on. Uh, and then just like a function, you can pass all your user-defined inputs uh, from, from, from an input to be processed later on in the module. That's fine. The big thing to note, and again, I'll come back to this uh, in the next example in a bit more detail, is the first line of every UI module must contain this namespace function. Um, I will go into that in a bit more detail in a second. So if we just look at how you would then use that module within your Shiny app. So the code down here on the bottom is from the main UI script that is within the app. Uh, and you can see here that the, the shiny module is actually called just like a function from within the main script. Uh, and each time I've called it, I've given it a unique ID. So background, background part two, background part three. That's it. I'm not very good at coming up with names. Now you can see how I've struggled with the conflicting names before. Um, but that's how you distinguish between each of the modules every time you call it. Uh, and each time I've given it a unique uh, title that's gonna be displayed on the box and a unique text file to process as well. So if we just have a look at how that would appear in uh, the Shiny app, you can see here now that that UI module has been repeated three times for three unique different text inputs. It's a very simple module. I, I won't pretend that it's groundbreaking this text one, but hopefully it can see as an example of how you can repeat modules over and over again to repeat certain elements of your code without having to reprogram it each time. We also have the advantage here that if we needed to change anything about one of these text boxes, such as the background color, the font size, or anything like that, there's only one place we now need to update it. That's in the Shiny module itself. We don't have to remember to do it three times, four times, five times, however many times you need it. It's there, ready to go, you can update it. So that was a very simple, very standalone module that was just looking at a UI in isolation. So how do we actually get a UI module and a server module to communicate to each other? They're, these are effect, effectively our functions generating two independent elements to a Shiny app. So this is where the namespace function comes in that I was talking about. And the namespace function effectively allows you to start storing input IDs in a hierarchical structure. So that module ID that I showed you about before combines with the namespace function. Uh, this is all a bit abstract at the moment, but hopefully you'll see it on the next slide in a bit better detail. Um, but effectively it allows you to store all the input names you use in a shiny UI module within the ID for that particular module, whatever you've called it. So by wrapping things around, so say we had a counter button in our app and we called it counter button, we can wrap that name within the namespace function. And that means we can, the counter button name doesn't need to be unique anymore. It needs to be unique in each individual module, but
But every time we repeat that module, we don't need to call it counter button two, three, four, five. It can remain stationary as counter button because it's stored within this hierarchical um, structure. So, um, uh, da, 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 yeah. Um, so if I just look at a more complicated UI now, so this is just a simple numeric input, but what I want to appear here is because I assume it's some form of limitation with our, uh, the HTML code when it comes to putting numeric inputs in our Shiny. But if you have the numeric input and you click the up and down arrows, the minimum and maximum values work. You can't go below those. But users can overtype the numeric input, and I'll show you this as an example in a second. You can go below and above the preset defined minimum and max maximum values in your app. Thus, you could have people entering values that completely break your results. So what I wanted to do is actually create a module that takes a numeric input and then produces some kind of warning error uh, if people enter a value that's not valid. So it's just some data input validation that's going on here. So as we can see here, the first line of the UI module, again, is this namespace function. It's taking the module ID and saying, associate all the names that I'm going to pass to you to this particular module ID. Because I've got multiple UI elements here, I just have to wrap them together in the tag list function. Maybe someone who's better familiar with HTML can tell me why that needs to be done, but I've seen it on a lot of the R blogs and everything that it needs to be done to help for the stability. And I can vouch for that as well. Sometimes it goes a little bit wrong if you don't put in the tag list function. Uh, but here we can see that for the numeric input, if you're used to Shiny, you would have just called that input ID warning input. But this time we're passing that name to the namespace function. So again, I don't need to come up with new names for a warning input every time I repeat the module. I can just give the module a new name instead. So if we then look at the corresponding server to this, I've only put the highlights here, but the full code is available via GitHub. But effectively, this example server here, what's going on is, uh, again, it's just a server function. I'm just storing the, uh, going to create a reactive value here to store the output because I want to be able to use that numeric input people are providing to the model further on in the app. But I, so I'm just creating a reactive value to store it for future use. The input from the UI then goes through a series of data validation checks. But you can see here that because we use the namespace function in the UI, I just need to pass it the, the input name warning input. But that's because it's going to be linked together using the module ID. So the server already knows which one to go look for. It doesn't need to go and use the hierarchical structure. You're giving it the top level, and then it can go on and use that. Again, it avoids this whole namespace conflict issue. Uh, once the input has been through uh, all the validation checks, it just returns um, here just as that reactive value so I can use it for further on in the app. So how do you call a server? Well, it's very similar really to the UI element. You could just call it as a function if you want. But I found the best way to do it is use the call module function. Um, some of the R blogs say this is a little bit outdated now, but I found it the most reliable way um, if you're trying to return an element to that server that you want to use later on, because the call module allows you to just store it as an object output. And we can see here that we use the call module function. We pass the name of our server, the ID, and this ID must match the UI element. So this is how all the functions in the server know which warning input I need. It's the warning input that's under this sensitivity standard error that's going on um, within this particular example. And I've passed it a bunch of series of user-defined inputs as well. Uh, and then that is just going to store the numeric input as, a, as an object when it comes out. But because of all that, I know that any number stored must pass the data validation checks. So this can be repeated for as many numeric inputs, and it doesn't have to be limited to numeric inputs. This is just the example I've got here for this particular module. But this can be repeated as many times as I need within the app. And this entire server code here, because of the amount of validation checks that are going on, it's about 55 lines of code. If you had 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 sets of numeric inputs that you wanted to have the same validation checks to over and over again, Yes, you could call a function. 
but this way it allows you to avoid all the namespace issues and so on and so on. And then just by recalling the module over and over again, you save a lot of repeated code that's going on. You have also, um, it, again, it comes back to this thing of if you introduce an error in one place, well, I've only got one place to now go and correct it. Or if I want to add in a new data validation check, I've only got one place to go do it. And if I've got 30 numeric inputs, I know I'm gonna get to do it on one of them. Um, so this is, this is all about trying to reduce down the amount of code within your app, but it's also trying to reduce down the amount of work you need to do to get your apps up and running. Oh, in fact, just before I go on to that, I'm gonna try and be brave and switch to the actual app. Seems to be working. Uh, so this is the demo app. Uh, how long is left? Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh. Um, so this is just a demo app, as you can see here. There's not much to it, and annoyingly, all the Zoom interfaces over the top. Oh, let's just shift that down there. Um, so it's just it's just got the three pages on it. We've got a home, a background, and the decision tree page. Uh, got our background. These are all the text boxes that I showed you before. It's a screenshot. But if we now look at the decision tree, so we've got a couple of numeric inputs repeated over and over again. Uh, and just to show you what the data validation check, this is what I was talking about, by the way, if I use the, the numeric arrows and go all the way down, I can't go below 0% validation, 0% uh, disease prevalence. That's great. But along comes someone and just goes minus nine. You can enter that. Shiny will run that for you, even though it's below your preset minimum. It will just take it. Don't, don't, don't ask me why. It's one of my pet peeves, but it will do. So this is why I've come up with this little module here. And now I'm going to have to move the zoom thing again. Uh, oh, no, this craft just at the bottom there. Um, so, but yes, um, does that bring it back up now? Um, so yeah, so, so we can see here, as soon as someone enters a incorrect value, it changes the input to orange, gives you a little indicator that it's wrong, tells you what you must do instead. And then annoyingly in this bottom right corner, you can't see it here, but there is a little red warning input box um, just to say it's wrong. Um, and again, that's a lot of code that needs to be repeated if you've got to protect yourself against anyone coming along and saying there's minus nine people in my population. Like if, if you don't use modules like this to try and do that, the code will execute anyway. So, so this is just a handy way of avoiding 55 lines of code over and over again to try and protect your app. Uh, and then in the interest of time, there's still going to be a few minutes left. Um, I'm just going to highlight that modules can be nested. They don't always have to be called from the main UI uh, on main server script. You can put a module within a module within a module, like whatever the limit of your imagination is, is the limit to what you can do here. So I like to think of shiny modules really as a bit like a Lego brick. You create your individual block, but you can then build that up. That same block can be used to make a Lego house, but it could also be used to make the Lego desktop. Like, however you want to do it, you can do it as long as you've then got these little building blocks you can build up. Um, uh, this is just an example of, of how it's being nested here. So this is just a server that's got a uh, unique knob input as well, but then I'm calling my number warning input from within that as well. So that's just a module being nested and you get things like this. So, so that what we saw in the app here, these are just the two numeric input warnings, which I'll refer to as a child module, but this entire test A box is a parent module. Uh, and that's that's the key thing. So in this case, I've got test A, but I've got test B, C, D, but how many comparators I've got for the screening method, I can now just have one module and I can repeat that over and over again. I get the sensitivity, specificity inputs, as well as two standard errors that have data validation built into them. So you can start seeing as you build these shiny Lego blocks, how you can build up and save a lot of code over and over again. And the other good thing, by the way, is once you've made a module for one app, you can transfer it straight to another app. Right? It's, like I said, it's a Lego house one minute, it's a Lego Death Star the next. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so that's really it, to be honest. Uh, today, so it, I can only say it saves you repeating code over and over again. Maybe I should have made a module to stop me repeating that over and over again, but there we are. Um, you can use them across multiple apps. And my favorite thing, because I'm not very imaginative, by using these modules, you can avoid having to come up with weird and wacky names for your shiny inputs. That's it. Thank you very much.
group. Uh, I have a question, if not. Um, have you got any experience of using modules for things like testing with debugging? Was it, in terms of, I've created shiny apps, and it can be really difficult to find bugs when, you know, stuff's wrong, you can't find it. Mm. By modularizing it, can you sort of uh, write a test for a module? Um, I've never written a test for a module, but what I will say is because um, because the module modules allow you to break up certain elements. When you get that air warning error, you go, oh, it's something's broken. It's like, well, all of a sudden, the code you've got to check for where that error is is suddenly reduced to whatever the module is reporting that the error existed. So I, I've never done it in the sense that you write a test as a module or run a module through its own specific debugging test. But I have found that it helps a lot in terms of quality assurance of your models is because there's far less code to check. Um, so, but yeah, sure. Yeah, I wonder if you could run a module in isolation for something. Like that. In theory, yes, because because it is just a function that's making yeah. a, a shiny UI element. So um, that yeah, you could absolutely run it in isolation if you wanted to. I just and figure out how yet. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, there any questions online? Yeah, in the chat. I bring up the chat. Not really. Not really. Okay, this is another question. Question in the room? Yeah. So, uh, thank you for the presentation and the web site is showing up. So, uh, my question is uh, is that the name of the module? So, you are using some front end style uh, uh, framework. Oh, uh, the, the yeah, front end to the actual. Oh, uh, so, so the question, uh, I believe, I'm sorry, I'm slightly hard of hearing. So at this distance, how you can tell me if I got the question right or not. Uh, but the question was, was the UI, the front end user interface, was that to do with an actual module or was it shiny itself type thing? Uh, yeah. Else. yeah, well, uh, that's shiny dashboards. That's a package that I've used quite a lot that I think makes nicer front ends to shiny than uh, regular shiny can do so it's just called shiny dashboards i believe and you can then combine it with another package called shiny themes um, that allow you to input your own color schemes and everything like that without needing to know css code because i believe that's how shiny does it and learning r and html was hard enough to then throw in a third one so, yeah, actually, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, there's not css at all no uh, that's a lie. There's a little bit, um, but nothing major. Like the the majority of the so sorry. The question in the room was: There's no uh, CSS in that at all. Uh, there's a little bit because to make the warning input orange, I had to put in a bit of CSS into that. But that's where Stack Overflow comes in handy, isn't it? Um, but in terms of the actual color scheme, no, that's that can all be handled through our packages as well. Question in the chat. Oh, uh, could you repeat one more time why use the namespace? Yeah, so, so the, the namespace function there is uh, if I just go back, hopefully, right, uh, to one, here's the, yeah. So the namespace function here uh, it effectively takes the module ID that you're giving it, that's the first line, uh, the first argument you have to give it in the function. It's basically saying store all the names that I'm going to pass you in these inputs within the module ID. So this is setting up the hierarchical structure of the namespace. Um, so then when you've got further inputs later on, you just also wrap them in the namespace function. And now it knows that this namespace is unique to this module ID. So the only times you need to worry about naming conflicts now is making sure your modules have different names. Um, and that would be it. <laughs> 